speaker today is uh, Justin Woodhouse from Concrete Consultancy 2000, who are testing has. Uh, Justin's going to talk about the inspection and testing of reinforced concrete. Justin, over to you. Thanks very much. Cheers. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Justin Woodhouse. <coughs> I'm the director of a um, company called the Concrete Consultancy 2000 Limited. Um, we deal with the inspection and testing of concrete structures, predominantly reinforced concrete structures. A uh, little, bit, little bit of background about me, I come from a contracting background, so I have a far more practical view on quite a lot of things. Uh, although we are a technical company in terms of the inspection and testing we carry out, um, we are always looking forward to a practical solution, because nine times out of ten it's all based on money. So we have to find a solution which will fit your budgets. A little bit about the beginning of concrete and the formation of fairly large assets which uh, obviously need to be maintained. Uh, some of the landmark structures you have, uh, particularly for reinforced concrete uh, construction, you have the Hoover Dam built in 1936, one of the largest reinforced concrete structures ever constructed at that time certainly. Um, you have Britain's contribution which is uh, Park Hill Estate, 1961, the Rabbit Warren. Um, then you have Trellick Tower in London, 1966, um, designed by Erno Goldfinger, and uh, um, one, of, one of the structures on London Skyline that you either love or you hate, but either way, it's, it's now um, a listed structure and um, quite an important part of the development of reinforced concrete. Um, and talking about the development of reinforced concrete, as I touched on earlier, really it's about maintaining structures. Um, uh, the previous speaker discussed the principles of corrosion and what does and doesn't happen. Um, but what you need to know really is the extent of it. Uh, before, you can, before you can come up with any kind of repair solution, you really need to know what the nature, the cause, and the extent of the problem is. Well, the nature is normally bits of it falling off, um, which is fairly straightforward and everyone can see it. The cause of that can actually be um, a number of things. Primarily, with 60s buildings that we're dealing with, they're usually construction defects. Um, there are other atmospheric conditions which we'll touch on a little bit further through, but I'm conscious of my time and I'll try and catch up. <coughs> so, typical construction defects are low cover to reinforcement. Um, that's a pretty low cover there, as you can see, the crank bars at the ends there are pretty much on the surface. So, um, they were always going to be a problem. Um, this is a structure that's actually the 16th floor of a structure in London. Um, so large chunks of this were falling off, which was obviously a bit of a problem for the residents. Um, and when we got up there, we took off everything that was loose and sprayed prime on these prior to the uh, repairs being carried out. Um, poor compaction, it happens. Um, day joints are a, a classic for poor compaction. What normally happens is where you have areas cold jointing, if you like, between slabs or between pores, you'll end up with pore compaction or you'll end up with cold jointing, which will leave a fracture through it between the two, two cuts. Therefore, it's a great place for water ingress or anything else that may, may be problematic. Incorrect mixtures and additives. Um, a classic you can see here is there's basically no aggregate in there. It's sand, effectively. Um, what you have here is, you should see, is concrete but it's actually not it's just sand so it wasn't surprising that a large chunk of it fell off again you can see the sort of heights you're looking at here just by looking at the um, the distance from here so when you get chunks like this falling off it's it's potentially hazardous to say the least um, inclusions all sorts of things get left within concrete structures when they're cast um, I think one of the famous ones is shopping trolleys um, <laughs> They're quite prolific in some London structures and in, um, in other areas, uh, other than bodies, obviously. There's a lot of those, like the M1, I'm sure. Um, uh, but with this, this particular instance, we've got a, we've got a metal tube there, which uh, who knows what that was, uh, something that somebody left in there. Then you've got some insulation tape that somebody's decided to wrap around the metal tube, obviously, to do whatever they were doing with it before. Then you've got this metal plate here, which nobody really knows what that is. And then just to finish it off, you've got some duct tape that somebody stuck over the metal plate so that they could put a repair over the top of it and cover it up. So you've got a whole wind treble there, really, um, all of which fell off when um, 
ultimately what happened was corrosion occurred on this steel plate here and pushed the uh, repair off. Move on to the environmental effects. Um, these were touched on by the earlier speaker. Uh, primarily you have carbonation of the cover concrete. Um, carbonation is a, a process whereby if concrete is left exposed and doesn't have a barrier, as the previous speaker was, uh, was talking about, <coughs> what will happen is carbon dioxide will diffuse into the pore structure of the concrete itself, because if you look at it under a microscope, it's basically like a sponge. Um, and this has a pore water left, residual pore water left within it. As the carbon dioxide diffuses into this pore water, it forms a weak carbonic acid. So, as discussed earlier, concrete has to have and maintain a high pH if corrosion of the steel isn't going to occur. So what happens is this carbonic acid gradually negates the effects of the pH being high to protect the steel, and so carbonation occurs. So carbonation works from the outside inwards as a front, and what it does is it reduces the alkalinity of the covered concrete until it reaches the steel, and because the alkalinity is so low there, that corrosion can occur what will happen is corrosion will occur and you'll get expansive corrosion with carbonation. So what happens is you get a corrosion product on the steel which will expand. And as it expands, it forms expansive pressure and so ends up spalling the external concrete or the cover concrete around it. You have freeze thaw, water ingress. This is a nice car park. Um, you can see actually what you have here is a day joint which goes through here. This is where these two sections were cast one on the left and the one on the right. And this is the joint between the two. And as I discussed earlier, because you get cold jointing, you will end up with a fracture through it or a crack through it or just a poor joint. Um, because the upper surface um, was never maintained correctly, so the membrane failed, and it took quite a long time for all of this to occur. But again, it all comes down to <coughs> whether or not people have got enough money to repair the membrane above before they get to this situation, which then costs them an awful lot more money. So you have uh, water ingress and free store action. Again, moisture continually saturating these undersides of these beams here has caused this expansive corrosion, as well as free store action, which obviously everybody knows about and is fairly well covered. Um, they have the ingress of chlorides. Um, these, this is actually a coastal structure, uh, and what you have here are precast panels and what's happened is chlorides have been in the atmosphere and they've ingressed or got into the substrate here. And because they're free chlorides, they're not bound as part of the mix, <coughs> they, they're quite well available, providing you've got moisture, which would be a vehicle for them to move on, to get further and further in until they reach the depth of the reinforcement. And once they reach the depth of the reinforcement, they will initiate corrosion, as the previous speaker said. The difference between carbonation and chloride corrosion is carbonation, as I said, is expansive. So therefore, it expands and the cover concrete cracks and falls off. With chloride-induced corrosion, it's more consumptive. So as the previous speaker said, you have little pits. And these little pits are, are quite significant. And what they do is they get bigger and bigger and bigger until you end up with a loss of section of the steel. When you end up with a loss of section of the steel, there's not a lot binding it together. Um, you can also end up with expansive sections where you have carbonation and chloride-induced corrosion. So you get the best of both worlds with those. Um, but again, the ultimate effect is a large chunk of it will fall off probably from quite a height. Uh, the standard test methods that we employ are all um, very straightforward in all honesty. Um, but <coughs> primarily, it's about using your eyes, which is the best tool you can possibly have. Um, they involve a visual and hammer wrap. So because the majority of concrete structures nowadays are either coated or in this case they're mosaic tiled, what you end up with is perhaps an expansive corrosion problem going on underneath the coating. Now the coating may look fine from the outside and from the floor, <coughs> but the moment you actually tap that, you'll find it'll sound hollow. So, in the majority of cases, it's always wise to carry out a full visual, because you're going to need to see what's going on, and a hammer wrap survey, which just involves rubbing a hammer over the entire concrete surface, and you will pick up these hollow sections, which you might not necessarily see from the ground or even close up. 
Uh, we employ a number of access techniques. The most cost effective is roped access. Um, that saves you having to put a scaffold up. Um, and it means that we can identify what the nature, cause and extent of the problem is, particularly the extent, before you've actually got to get involved with a contractor and, and put everything to rights. Um, cover meter survey. This is a, a very clever bit of kit. Um, you can see there's actually not a lot of cover there, but anyway. Uh, this, this little machine actually is an electromagnetic cover meter. And what it does is it, it, it will tell you exactly where the steel is as you draw it across on its, on its little wheels. And it'll give you a picture of where it is there, and it'll also give you the depth. Now, you might not think that's particularly important, but if you're dealing with the other tests which you've got to do, this is a very, very important part of it. Because until you know what depth the steel is, you don't necessarily know what the relevance is of what the carbonation depth is and what perhaps depth chlorides have got to. So cover is always the best place to start. You have carbonation depth testing. You can see here that you have, this is effectively the carbonation front. Everything that is purple is alkali. Everything that is white is not. Carbonation depth testing is carried out using phenothaline, which is a, a universal indicator solution. And what it will do is you, you freshly break concrete in an area of concern or anywhere on the structure and um, spray it with phenothaline. <coughs> and as you'll see, where the pH is pretty high and the concrete is still in reasonably good condition in terms of carbonation, it will, it will go this nice magenta colour. Where it is white is where the alkali is not sufficient enough to turn the indicator solution the, this colour. The relevance of carbonation against cover is obviously pretty obvious because if you have steel at, let's say, 60 millimetres and your carbonation is only 20 millimetres, then you've actually got quite a long time before carbonation of that structure is going to be a problem. So it's about weighing up what you do as a repair, looking at the information that you have. It's diagnostics, basically. Um, chloride or HAC analysis, again, if you need to know if there are chlorides within this concrete, then you need to, to take samples of it. These are done using straightforward dust sampling techniques and um, should really be, uh, the, the dust that's collected should really be um, analysed by either a UCAS or NAMAS accredited laboratory. And there are a few other ones that are about, but you're better off going to one that actually has all the bells and whistles in terms of badges. Uh, core sampling. Um, this is a job where they were putting a mezzanine floor in a warehouse structure. So what they needed to know is what the compressive strength of the concrete is, but also what was underneath it. So what the full depth was, what the compressive strength of that cover concrete is, what the cover to the reinforcement was, what the steel reinforcement was that was in there, because like always, there's no drawings for any buildings anywhere, nine times out of ten. So it's all about doing as minimal damage as you can, but finding out as maximum information as you can. Half cell potential. Uh, previous speaker discussed um, how the corrosion process gives up energy. In simple terms, as we saw in the diagrams, um, corrosion is effectively two areas of differing potential on the same, same steel surface. So what you will have is a transfer of energy or a transfer of current. Now, if you have a transfer of current, you can measure it. And using either a copper copper sulfate or a silver silver chloride probe, you can connect the reinforcement within, within say, a car park deck slab such as this to one area, to one end of the, of the circuit, and then you can use a probe on the surface of the concrete, either silver silver chloride, which is what we use, or copper copper sulfate, and you can effectively measure the current or the voltage which is being provided by the corrosion process. So what you end up with is numbers, and those numbers are millivolts, measured in millivolts, and they are negative. If they are positive, then you don't have a problem. If they are in the negative, then you do have a problem. So if you take that and take it into uh, colour coding, what you will have is quite a large area which you can cover quite quickly and provide an equal potential plot, which is what this is, showing you where the hot spots of corrosion activity are, which you can see because they're coded red, and where there are other areas which actually everything's pretty good. You can back these you can back these areas up by targeting these with dust sampling, with core sampling, with exposure to the reinforcement, 
just to absolutely confirm what you are and aren't seeing from this level of, um, of survey work. Reporting, well, the most important thing on, on any report is effectively the description of the defects that you've found. Um, it's important to know the nature because there may be three or four different types and they may not all relate to, this, to a similar problem. So it's important to actually describe individual ones or certainly typical instances of them. Uh, photographs of typical defects because normally a picture tells a thousand words. Uh, drawings of the locations of defects. Well these are really important because if you gather enough information as to where things are, anybody else going to that site will know where to look and there may be <coughs> an instance where they would need to see something specific. So it's pretty important to produce some decent drawings. Uh, drawings of the sample locations because you need to know where the problems are that we would have found and certainly where the locations were of say things like high carbonation or elevated chloride levels. Uh, factual results of the tests undertaken. All of our reports contain uh, UCAS accredited certificates of analysis so they're independently analysed. We don't deal with, um, uh, with any of the, uh, the chemical analysis ourselves in-house. Uh, certificates of analysis, because you're going to need to have proof that they have been done properly. Conclusions. Well, if you take all the information that you've gained having carried out the survey, you should, by rights, be able to come to a conclusion, i.e. it's going to fall down or it's not going to fall down or you need to repair it within the next one to two, two to five, five to ten years. A summary and recommendations. We will always provide a summary and recommendations in that there is no point in having all this information if it's just generated as numbers and given to you saying, now you interpret it, because that's not your job. You're the person who's asked somebody else to say, I have a problem, so how do I put it right? So any report should always have a summary and recommendations. Quite often they will also have a material specification or you will have enough information from this <coughs> to go to a material manufacturer and ask for their recommendations. Similarly, a bill of quantities. Even if it's a provisional bill of quantities, if you have found out what the defects are, you photograph them and you have locations of them, then you can also find out the quantity. And if you have the quantity, you are armed with a lot of information that you can then go to a contractor with and say, how much does that cost to put right? If you don't have that information, it's sort of pie in the sky and you are relying on somebody else telling you what they want to do as opposed to you telling them what they should do. I've tried to catch up and I think I probably have because I think we're back on, back on track now. Um, but that's me and thank you very much for listening. And does anybody have any questions? None at all? Any questions? It must have been very well. No? Fantastic. Thank you very much.